Well, hello and welcome uh, to this, the, the next, I suppose, the, the next webinar in our series. As you know, we ran a number of webinars um, over the last academic year on work-based assessment. It's a topic that I don't think we can actually talk about uh, too much because it's a tricky topic. It's, it's something that we need to, to keep talking about to be able to find uh, ways forward with some of the issues that are, are, um, are facing us. Just to let you know that the webinar is being recorded and we will make it available um, after uh, once we've got it downloaded and, and that will make it available on the National Forum website. And on behalf of the National Forum and uh, our partners in this in running this webinar, QQI, we really thank you for your support and thank you for your interest in the topic. Um, there's going to be opportunities to talk, uh, so don't worry during the, the, the webinar. Just to remind you, the webinar is going to extend from 12 until uh, 1.30, and um, so that you, you you have that kind of time frame. If there's if you have uh, commitments at after one o'clock and you need to go, we, we completely understand. Um, I'm going. I am delighted actually that I don't have much to do in this webinar except to hand over to the person who's going to facilitate it, and I'm also delighted that uh, Geraldine O'Neill. Uh, who is going to facilitate it, is going to be talking about some initial findings from the research she's doing as one of the National Forum's inaugural Teaching and Learning uh, Research Fellows. So, Geraldine, I'm going to hand over to you. Great, that's great. Thank you very much, Terry. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and I already see people in the room that have been part of the research, so uh, great to see them. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And I will get started on the presentation. Um, for for those who uh, for those who know me, um, I'm um, or don't know me, I suppose. <laughs> I'm uh, Geraldine O'Neill, and I work in UCD teaching and learning. But as Terry says, I'm one of the National Forum Teaching and Learning Research Fellows, and this research is coming from from that uh, from that work. So I'm delighted to be able to present some in interim the, the results. The the data is still being analysed further and will be presented um, later on this year and Terry will talk about that and also we'll be, we'll be publishing it. But we thought we'd give you a bit of a taster, uh, particularly as those some of those who have actually been part of it, it's great that they can see some, some of the stuff coming out. Um, so some of the stuff that um, we saw coming out of the, the work was things around competencies, um, expectations and learning contracts in work-based assessment. And, we really thought it's useful to see how these might be related. So we felt that this was an, a useful opportunity to look at these kind of some of these key themes that are, that are coming through. And I suppose some of the challenges in assessing work integrated learning um, are well, the first one of first is is the key challenge is expectations of what is to be assessed. And um, they're going out in very different placements. So what are the, the different expectations can be a challenge. Uh, the diverse learning opportunities by the placement or experience for, for these competencies can be a challenge because they go to different places and it's not all the same and that's the, the strength of it, I suppose. Um, but on top of that, you've got the unique learning goals of the students. So students differ, their experience differs and they're going to these diverse places. So there's a lot of diversity um, and yet we're trying to assess in this context. So it's quite a challenge in relation to these three things. So this session in particular is presenting, as I say, my National Forum um, Fellowship Research and it's highlighting some of the initial findings. And really what we want to try and do in this session is to understand and discuss, that's why we, we do want you to be part of a discussion, um, these three challenges. And we're trying to do it in the context of the higher education landscape, um, which is a very challenging um, landscape in itself. So what we thought was very useful is Sue Hackett from QQI is just going to quick give a quick overview of some of the assessment challenges in, in the higher education landscape. So Sue, I'll hand over to you for um, looking at some of the assessment landscape issues. Thanks Geraldine and, and hi everybody. It's great to be here and it's I know it's going to be so interesting to hear about Geraldine's uh, fantastic work that she's been doing and some of the findings. So I'm just here, to, I'm here actually on behalf of Peter, who could, Peter Cullen, who my colleague, couldn't be here um, this morning, just to give you, um, just to give us an opportunity over the next few minutes to step back 
and look at the um, perhaps the assessment landscape in um, in all its complexities, reflecting QQI's remit um, in relation to assessment. So if you may recall, since the publication of the assessment green paper, um, the publication of the report on the stakeholder responses to this, uh, to this green paper, this year, earlier on, we held a number of one-to-one -one interviews with um, key stakeholders focusing on rethinking assessment. That was the kind of overarching topic, asking them what they would like to see ideally addressed an assessment and what were the current issues as they saw them. So this graphic really um, summarizes the issues that were raised and the related co um, considerations under each heading, which came up. And of course, we could have gone on and on and on, um, putting more and more issues underneath each one. But, um, you know, uh, I hope that at least captures the main, the main points. As you can see, it's extremely wide ranging and of course, complex from that high level of um, instilling confidence in our qualifications and the, the many reasons why this is so critically important to identifying all the stakeholders who need to be need to have an active and collaborative role in rethinking assessment, developing it and, uh, um, and the, uh, the practice using it as well. Um, the need for students as partners in the co-creation of assessment approaches academic integrity and all that that involves. And I'm, I'm sure you've um, heard a lot more about that in uh, other webinars, et cetera, as well. And indeed the critical role of change leadership. Now, those are the ones I've picked out. There are other things there as well, but um, obviously you can have a look at these in your, uh, at your leisure later, um, look at this slide. And indeed, if you have any questions, uh, please let, let us know. Thanks, Geraldine. So what do we know and what do we need to rethink? And uh, these are some really obvious uh, headings. I know you probably can look at them and go, for goodness sake, um, we all know that. But of, um, but of course, it's what is under the iceberg, what, what is under the water um, and what do they really mean? So many people brought up, you know, assessment has been so critically important. It provides a purpose and a focus for teaching and learning. Of course, we know that. But, um, but equally, that assessment is not some ivory tower um, sort of experience or activity which takes place discreetly. It must be planned, designed, developed, um, fought through in the same way that teaching and learning is fought through as well and in an integrated way. Um, we all know that probably in theory, but the real um, challenge is how much we have managed to realize this to date in practice and what further do we need to do. I've already mentioned confidence in our qualifications. This was a very common comment um, from, from stakeholders um, and indeed um, came from our interviews with the department as well. So confidence in the quality of our provision and our qualification system obviously rests on assessment, which is valid, consistent, aligned to intended learning outcomes. That was a key issue that kept coming up reflects the target community needs, reflect, as Geraldine referred to their student goals, and upholds our um, national reputation, not least. Trust in the education system is sort of related to two, so I won't say too much more about that. That was again talked about again and again. Valid assessment is a core part of that, needs to be consistent, fair, equitable, reliable, all those, all those things that we know about, we talk about, but have we actually managed to incorporate it into our practice? And then concerns around the impact of assessment. When we see, for example, particularly during the COVID period, the rise in um, online e-cheating of various types from perhaps minor to really serious, the more contract cheating end of things, we really understand the pressure students are under to, um, to manage their assessment and the law of misconduct. So how are we addressing that? How are we really helping students to um, avoid that sort of thing and how aware are we of the impacts of assessment in the long term and in its sort of life changing um, uh, potential for those students that's really a heavy responsibility. 
So some key, cha key challenges, staff expertise, the need for staff training was raised again and again, um, also underlining that it's not some kind of ivory tower science. Um, the need also for learner training, le including learner orientation around infrastructure, institutional infrastructures, which need to enable assessment, which is responsive to its context, context and maintains um, validity. And again, this was a very common uh, issue that was raised, which was, well, it's very difficult. Our, our infrastructure is very clunky. It takes a long time to make any changes in terms of assessment. And we really have to convince so many people, et cetera, et cetera. Programs and learning outcomes, particularly, as I just said, the alignment of learning outcomes to assessment. And interestingly, this issue around modules and programs, there was a certain um, sense from the interviewees that um, the program has disappeared or is disappearing when we uh, focus so much on the modular system. Um, academic integrity, I've already talked about that. I'll, I'll skim over that. And indeed, um, that we have a lot of material on that if you'd like to learn more. Um, digital assessment and how we are articulating that rather than just transposing face-to-face -face assessment into a digital arena. Again, that's a whole issue. Um, and QQI has some separate work going on around uh, EPROC train, and we will have a report being published um, in late October on that. And finally, the assessment of competences. And I know Geraldine's talk is going to uh, talk more on that. So I suppose um, just as a final word to say that a central component of QQI's new strategic strategy and the focus in this strategy is to continue to take a lead on assessment in relation to QQI's remit around uh, quality assurance um, and qualifications. And we fully recognize that there's need for a close scrutiny of this key area and support that we need to provide for all our stakeholders. Um, and of course, we will continue to liaise and collaborate with key partners such as the um, such as the National Forum. And it has really been and is such a pleasure to be able to work with them on this work based assessment initiative. Thanks, Geraldine. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Sue, for that. that that's great to get the kind of the, the broader background about what's happening in assessment. Um, both from the, I suppose, the enhancements and the quali uh, quality, um, the QQI um, kind of their remit in, in the assessment um, system. So thank you for that, Sue. Um, I suppose moving specifically then more onto assessment of work integrated learning. Um, back last year, it seems like three years ago, but back at the beginning of last year, uh, we ran a series of webinars and we asked people, what was the challenges that they had? What did they value in, in work-based assessment? Different themes came through, but a really key theme that came through was the, the thought that assessment should be real life, meaningful assessment in the work-based. So really um, important that it, it makes sense is very linked with sort of what is seen as authentic is the word that was used but it also needs to be consistent and, and sue alluded to that that you need to be able to stand over it needs to be trustworthy um, and it needs to do these two things so the research then that i decided to do was trying to look at both of these how can we do these both well um, and how do we optimize these so this was the focus of my research project um, from the from the national forum funded by the national forum um, so, um, to tell you a little bit about the research, um, and again, if, if people are in the room are happy to share, I won't say uh, that they were involved, please do, I won't name them because I said there was to be anonymous, but you can name yourselves if you like to. Um, but there was two big methodologies in, in this. The first was I interviewed some key experts in the field um, about you know, to interrogate this, this is quite a complicated thing. How do we be consistent and authentic? How do we get both of these? So I had some really interesting conversations um, with, with people from around the globe. And um, there's a lot of work going on in Australia. Those who know this, this field well, in Canada, there's a lot of work going on. But different stuff is going on in Europe, so the Netherlands, Germany, and South Africa. Um, and so a lot of the research is coming from these areas. Um, so this is why I went with these, because they, they were key authors, even though there's lots going on in, in many different countries. So so they, I interviewed seven authors, so that's part of the research. And then I did nine 
what I call solution focused workshops with different disciplines um, across Ireland. And they were in three kind of broad areas. The first group were on campus and this is work integrated learning also includes that type of work that goes on in campus like project work and problem based learning that links very much with industry. So I included that in my research, although I'm not going to talk to that as much today, possibly, but I certainly included that group. The other groups that I included were um, those that are in placement out in practice but are primarily assessed by the educator. So these disciplines, they may go out and they may do sort of um, work experience, but they come up back to the institution, they write up a report or they do a presentation. That's that category, context B, so ed educator assessed primarily. And then there's another group that are primarily assessed by practitioners. So these are people like in, in the healthcare, they might be uh, physios, nurses, healthcare workers, social, social work, um, but they are very much um, assessed by practitioners, could be industry assessing them, could be teachers assessing them. So um, they are the, so the, so the two broad groups of placement. Um, and in the groups, I had about 120 um, participants, but what was really nice was there was an equal mixture of students, practitioners and higher education staff in these, in these groups across, across the different disciplines. So the different disciplines that were involved, uh, the blue being sort of more on campus was civil engineering and diagnostic radiography, because um, more project-based, problem-based learning types of ones. And then the light green and the dark green were more on placement. So there was hospitality, Institute of Technology, survey and construction management, a technological university, PE teaching was university, business information systems, a technological university, occupational therapy was university, and veterinary nursing was university. And they were assessed by practitioners, those, those, those two there. So they were the, the three, that sort of the nine um, types of, of disciplines. Um, I'd like to get a feel, if I can, in the room for, in your context, if you are currently doing it, are you primarily, is your placements, and these are placements out of practice, primarily assessed by the educator or primarily assessed by the practitioner? And I know there's often a mixture, but where's the waiting? And if none of these, maybe you could just put other, just to get a bit of a feel for the people in the room. So Colin here has shared the poll. I'm going to give you a minute or two to have a go of the poll. Just get a feel for, for those in the room. And then if you get a chance in the chat, is there any, any rationale for either including or excluding the practitioner? Is there a reason why you may, for example, I'm looking here slowly, but I'll share the results now in a second when I raise a chance. Um, it's leaning more to being assessed in the institutions and education. Is there a reason why you're not? Stick it in the chat, actually, just to get a feel for is there any reasons? Is it the way it's always set up? Um, any particular rationale? why you may not include practitioners. Okay. So 50-50, okay, Catherine, you're in the middle, so 50-50, okay, mixture. Yes, yeah, so a lot of people mixture. Um, Eleanor, mixture. You can share the, the poll, I think, now, Colin, actually, while people are putting stuff in the chat. <clears throat> So looking at this, that the, the mainly by the educator in the institution, but about 30% are in practice and others are, are none. Um, practitioners do the whole assessment. That's Maggie, yeah. Uh, work on a level of apprenticeship and it's a mixture. Okay, thank you for that for Anne. Cecily, uh, thanks Cecily, hi Cecily. Academic credit alliance with academic online modules that run concurrently for placement, but the preceptor determines whether competent or not. Okay, so that's, and again, there's different languages. Perceptor is a practitioner. Some people use perceptor, sometimes it's industry, sometimes employer, different words for the practitioner. Practitioner may not have the time or not wish to make assessment decisions. Jonathan, thank you for that. That comes up in the lot in the literature as well, that the practitioners don't particularly want to assess sometimes. Um, they don't feel they'd rather not assess. It's coming through quite a bit in the literature. Um, practitioners, EMA, are directly observing competence and they can provide with training in advance. Yes, training coming through. Yeah. Regulator expects clinical assessment competence. Yeah, Caroline. Yeah. So sometimes it's professional bodies, regulators. Um, but then sometimes when that's not there, that sometimes maybe people don't, I practitioners don't want to assess. Um, and then Claire, pl placement assessed by practitioner to meet competency-based standards, yeah, the regulatory bodies, yeah. Okay, great. 
you can stop that um, sharing, Colin, or yeah, just close the poll, but that's that's an interesting. Okay, thank you for that and keep them coming through. And Mary Rose, practitioners pass the students, we assess the written report according to our standards. That's a mixture, yeah. And practice is not always trained. Thank you for that, Trish, Mary Rose. Thank you for those. Okay, so just moving on to tell you a little bit about what we did, and actually the methodology itself people might be interested in, because it was a it's, it's called participatory learning and action methodology, very much about discussion um, with the with different stakeholders. So I say there were students, practitioners, um, higher education staff in these workshops, and they were very much mixed in all the breakout groups as well. Um, and just at the methodology we did it was all online in COVID times. <laughs> Uh, so all done on, on Zoom um, for three and a half hour the workshops were um, polls and jam boards, um, breakout groups for the discussion, coming back to a plenary, voting on the key challenges, coming up with some solutions and coming up with some potential actions. So hopefully all that were involved actually got a lot from actually being part of the session, but it's a methodology that really does push interstakeholder dialogue, so something you might be interested in yourselves. Lots of qualitative analysis done, uh, which I won't bore you with here, but it was done and it is being further done. And some key actions that are coming through, some key themes, and these were actions that people were thinking about. The first is the importance of clarification of the expectations for all the stakeholders. It was a really key thing coming through. The many, many mentioned lack of, of clarity and expectations. We don't know what to expect. And that was from all the stakeholders, including the students. The appropriate sensitivity of the assessment form, not having too many competencies. This was coming through quite a bit in the literature and from uh, the, the attendees at this workshop, that the assessment form had too many competencies on it. We'll come back to that. Valuing and recognizing the role of the practitioner, um, that coming through, certainly in, in, in some particular disciplines, this was coming through quite strongly. Some of the newer disciplines, um, exploring the appropriate grading scales that came through a lot, and we, we look at that. Supporting the interstakeholder dialogue. So this, although the workshops were interstakeholder dialogue, they were also saying we need to do more of this. This is the first time I was ended up in a room with a practitioner and a student and myself, so the higher education staff. So and actually having an honest conversation when the students weren't being assessed at this particular moment, and the students found it got a lot of positive feedback from the students and um, that they felt that their voice was heard and that they that they weren't being assessed at this moment it was an opportunity to have a dialogue around um, the the, um, the issues around assessment supporting student empowerment came through a lot and, and peer support groups students supporting students came through as an action that many of them thought about doing developing students ability to self-monitor was something that came through the development of learning contracts and supporting the use of authentic assessment and feedback approaches. So there's quite a few things coming through there. But what I thought was quite interesting and what I thought we would do today uh, was looking at some of these themes. So it's a subsection of some of the findings. And these three things came through quite strongly and, and are quite related. So competencies was coming through quite a bit. The clarity of expectations was coming through a bit. Interstakeholder dialogue was coming through. We, we need to do more of this. Um, and, and from that, maybe the use of learning contracts. So I'm going to work my way through these as themes for the next little while. So starting with, I suppose, competencies. This is a challenging one. And I know we've talked about this before in some of our previous webinars. But competencies um, was coming through. And I suppose competencies are often assessed on the generic and or disciplinary competencies. And some people are using very sophisticated models. And this is just a model um, that's out there. But some are using very sophisticated models. Others weren't using particularly sophisticated models. Often the, often the professional bodies, um, the ones in that context C that have professional accreditations, regulations, often have quite sophisticated models of competencies. Um, so, but there's often generic or um, sort of more discipline specific. And the language around this is quite challenging sometimes, and people are using different language around it. Um, standards is a term that's used um, to describe what students should know and be able to do in relation to established criteria. They're distinct statements and provide the building blocks for competencies. So standards are often building blocks for competencies. 
Um, the, the word competencies is one way of describing it uh, is how students apply and transfer their learning in new contexts and situations. So standards can be a bit more narrow, whereas competencies are allowing in new contexts and new situations, and they encompass often multiple standards assessed at multiple times and allow for the transfer of knowledge and skills across content areas. So that's one kind of definition of it. Another definition from the European Qualification Framework is competence means the ability. So it's slightly different from competencies, which are more like statements and, and how they're written. Competence is more a kind of a thing you own, I suppose. It's the ability to apply knowledge and personal social and methodological skills in the workplace or during learning, as well as in personal and professional development. So when you start, those that are looking at this the language of this can be quite confusing. I mean, competencies is even used in a way that describes a, a kind of a journey from competency to expertise. So it's used in that way, I think, quite a bit nursing. So there's different ways of how um, it actually um, is, is used. Um, and love to feed into your work. Yeah, well, I'm happy to chat to people. I'm just looking at some of the things in the chat. Happy to um, meet up with anybody afterwards to chat. Yeah, uh, and John from your industry are involved in giving feedback for our work placements. Yeah, great. Yeah, so yeah, thanks for that in the, in the chat. Keep the line in the chat. So, what were people saying about competencies. So in my research, in this national form research, some of the challenges that came out in this um, were from the first one here from hospitality, uh, too wide a range of standards. This was um, people saying that the spectrum across hospitality where they might be in a, in a big hotel versus a small coffee shop, there's so many different wide range of standards. How do we deal with these standards? There's too many of them and there's too, they're too wide. That was one, one particular challenge. Lack of consistent opportunity to demonstrate skills. Veterinary nursing mentioned that, that they don't always have the same opportunity, students. In physiotherapy, they talked about students struggling to achieve competencies in high pressure and specialized sites. So some, by the nature of the, the uh, work experience, struggled because it was kind of more high pressure. Um, diagnostic radiography talked about a lot of, there's a lot to learn in a short time. That was sort of the length of the placement, have, trying to pack things in. Um, business information systems talk about the wrong balance between technical and soft skills, that the technical skills can take a while to get, the soft ones you can see earlier, but, you know, trying to get the, the, the balance right between those two was a challenge. Occupational therapy mentioned the, the appropriate sensitivity of the assessment form, too many competencies. Um, again, a little bit like uh, hospitality, there's a lot there, and sometimes you can't see them all in every context. Um, and then PE teaching, pitching the task at a level that's meaningful for students. So getting a meaningful competency was something that came out of PE teacher. Um, Alice, just competence feels like it's one end of a scale communicating and mastery. Yeah, Alice, that is something that was talked about in the literature a lot, that competence is on, competence is on the spectrum um, and it's one way of, of, of that it is described, yeah. So one of the challenges that was coming out from these groups was how you what way do you grade these you know in, in a kind of a spectrum of grading the competency you know how do we grade them and what's the challenges around grading um, and interestingly and um, there was a real spectrum between the researchers that i talked to and the discipline groups there was it had the spectrum of that red to green on on that scale there uh, for example some people were pushing narrative feedback. So really just pushing feedback and the narration and description as one way of assessing, okay? Um, and then particularly in some of the European groups were looking at this, focus on and what, what they said, she said, was focus on the narrative feedback that is more meaningful and please let's get rid of these numbers in our assessment system. Okay, this ideal world, but this is what they were talking about and these are experts writing about it. So this is one end of the spectrum. The next one is pass fail, and I will be getting you to actually vote on this in a second. So have a little think about these. Are you using which ones you're using? Um, if you are using them, and I'll, I'll get you to vote in a second. Pass fail, uh, which is similar to competent, not yet competent. Is this kind of binary of you know pass or fail? This students spoke very highly of this because it released the pressure um, of actual. Um, 
grading and that they could relax and sort of concentrate on the learning. This was what the feedback on that was. And then there's kind of these ones in the middle here that are sort of bands or scales. Some people call it bands of proficiency. An interesting one I think that was used um, in medicine uh, is above at or below expectations, that's one, three grades. Uh, there was five point scales and seven point scales, but they aggregate, the interesting one about that one is they aggregated them across a number of placements. So it wasn't just one number, it was aggregated across. Um, and some of the language around that was, academic mo modules are graded, so professional practice should also be valued by grades. This was an argument for that. Well, if we grade our modules, why aren't we grading our placements if it's all, if we value placement? Um, aggregating scores has a meaning for the outliers. So it actually, even though some people didn't like the grading, where there was outliers, it was useful to pick students who were either, you know, maybe struggling. And then finally, there's percentages. And some of the language around that is, well, I want to do a master's and grades matter. So that is the spectrum of thought on this. Um, so what I thought I would do is, and again, Colin, do you mind um, putting up the poll? Um, what grading approach do you use? Um, and I've just kind of collapsed them a little bit there to narrative binary, which is pass, fail, competent, not yet competent, bands or grades, percentages, none of these. And again, and maybe stick again in the chat why you use or don't use them. So stick them in the chat once you've voted and I'll share the vote back in a minute when everybody's had a chance. Narrative feedback is coming through as a small number, but it's coming through that somebody's using it. That's great. Um, requirement of the module descriptor. Thanks for that, Sarah. Binary is coming through at the moment. I will share the results in a second. It's coming through as um, the top at the moment. Placements are also important to reckon students' performance in assessment. Yes, it's sentences, but with a detailed rubric. Yeah, thanks for that, Trish. Order used bands above meets below expectations. Great, thanks, Orla. Placement is 15 credit modules, so we mark the rubric and use percentages. Pass fail due to variety. That's a strong argument for the pass fail because of the variety. Like to pick narrative. Um, yeah, but yeah, a lot of people would like to pick that. Uh, you see that, yeah. Bands and grades to differentiate students and the regulatory boards require pass. Yeah, great. Thank you to seeing all those coming through. Could you end the poll there, economy and we'll see the results? Yeah. Yeah. So you can see that pass fail is coming through as the most common with bands the next percentage is the next and um, narrative is being used by by six people great um, and some of the arguments coming through are some of the things I was saying so um so I might stop that um thank you for that but you can see it's not there isn't a right and wrong answer but interesting the pass fail is probably the most common in this group here um so some of the solutions, I suppose, to some of these challenges. Um, the, and there's some really nice stuff coming through in the, in, in the chats there people might like to look at as well. Um, so some of the research participants suggested some solutions to these things. So reduce the number of competencies on the assessment form um, is one thing. Just let's collapse them. A lot of people are doing that internationally as well in the literature, just dropping them down, reducing the number because of this wide range allows students some choice of competence, competencies. Do they all have to do them all? And again, that goes back to the hospitality. I think in occupational therapy, we're, we're saying there's so many. Um, could they, is there opportunity for choice? Develop a more elaborate competency framework for those that don't have it. Align the competency stronger with industry or placement needs. So more of a stronger alignment. Allow formative assessment only on some competencies. Could it be feedback for some of them? or earlier on only. Need time to develop, uh, don't assess too early. That was coming through, um, I think that was coming through in, in, the, in the survey and construction management one. Um, flexibility for different competencies in different settings and levels. So flexibility coming through a lot as a suggestion. So flexibility, choice, there's some things coming through. So the first task we wanted to do was actually get you to chatting about this for a few minutes. So um, we're going to get you into breakout groups, okay? I would 
uh, there's going to quite quite a lot of, I think there's, there's um, about 150 of you in the room, I think at least. So there will be quite a few breakout groups. So can you take a note of the number when you're going into it? Okay. When you're actually getting into the breakout group, you should just take a note of the number you're in. And also you'll see it in either the top right hand corner or the top left hand corner um, when you get in. But if you can note it when you're going in better still. But what I want you to talk about is what are your experience and ideas for assessing competency? Um, have you a view on this, like in relation to the number, the level, the type? Um, you know, do you assess them all? You know, do you have large numbers? Is that a problem? Are they pitched at the right level? Do you have ones for different levels? And are there any implications for practice or policies? Okay, do you have any implications for practice and policies? So that's the question I want to put to you. You've about 15 minutes. Colin, would you mind yeah, clicking the instructions? Thank you for that, Colin. We've put the instructions in the chat here. And when you get put into the breakout group, what I would like is if someone would make some notes um, just to take notes for the group. We, we'll have it all in, on a Google shared document so we can share it back afterwards. So maybe avoid using people's names. But just some of your ideas around experiences, implications for practice and policy. The link is there. But I would say to you, don't share the document, talk to each other's faces, <laughs> but whoever is described can, can actually be typing away on the link. So when you get in to Skype on who might take a few notes and they'll, they, they can click on that link um, you, and you, you'll have to write it in your group number. So you'll have to, that's why the group number is important. So with that, I'm going to get Colin to put you into breakout groups and you have about, we, we're going to give you 15 minutes because it does take a good time. So what are your experience and ideas for assessing competencies and any implications for practice or your institutional policies, particularly those grading scales? Should we be looking at institutional grading scales as part of this? Um, so what are some implications? So off you go, Colin. OK, thanks for that. I think some people are coming in. Um, the link there is, is to pe if people still, if people who are typing still want to type, they can. The, the document is there. I'm just very quickly going to show some of the points that are coming through, but we will tidy this up and, and send it back to you. Um, can you see that, Terry? Can you see that screen all right? Can they see the document? Just so I can see you. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you can see that there's some, some nice conversations coming through. And as I say, people can, can type it up afterwards. Different ideas, uh, formal placement with competencies, group one there. I'm just gonna go down to group, um, interesting to, to to group eight because I thought just there's two points they brought up um, that actually are quite interesting um, from generally. The first is that employers are often generous with marking. This comes through a lot in the literature and it's it's a really challenging one because is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, and I think there's, there's, I did see a, a nursing article um, described once as the the um, nearly the scourge of great inflation and placement or something like that so and when you think of it employers practitioners are working very closely with people and they are often more generous they don't work off a normal curve i've said this before in previous webinars they don't work off of like a normal curve that we often do in higher education further education where we're trying to map people and differentiate um, and so they do are often more generous and it can come down very much to sort of personality as well um, you know what you think about a's and b's particularly getting a's and this is why i think the graded system is actually quite challenging because of differences in standards and different views of grading but generally practitioners are often more generous and um higher education for education often see that as a problem but maybe so this really needs to be interrogated a little bit more how do we do we, is, is it around more training with rubrics? Is it around um, going with different grading scales? Is it getting them to give different types of feedback? So it, it really is something that comes through a lot. And the other one I think that, that came through in, in a lot of your things is too many, too many competencies. So I can't go through them all. The reason why we put this in the thing is that you can actually um, have a look yourselves and look at what people have done. And, and we'll also tidy it up and share it back with you as, 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 a, um, as a group. So. I'm going to now go back to my slides um, and okay um, and go back to where I was. Um, okay, just a little bit more around the literature and this and what some and the researchers that I talked to, what they said about this. They talked about things about having broad competency, having broader competencies. This gets to the idea of having not having too many, but maybe broader, but equivalent projects and activities that people could do. Okay, so 
maybe having less loaded ones. Many of you mentioned too many. Um, so the research was saying maybe broader competencies, but having equivalents of how they could show them. Some choice in what they learn. Um, is there some choice that came through from the researchers as well? And one a nice quote that they said, if you want everything to be the same or equivalent across students, then by that, then by its nature, it can't. There's a tension between authenticity or getting sort of meaningful, relevant sort of assessment, because it won't necessarily bend and flex to the situation and to the individual's goals and desires and expectations and the needs of the workplace. And that's the tension, the tension between standardization and authenticity. So trying to get standards and competencies that are the same and yet trying to get it relevant is, is a real challenge. Um, so some of the stuff that we, people were talking about having broad and choice and there's an interesting literature which I, I just allude to you because I know some of the um, professional bodies and regulators are looking at this but there's interesting literature around principles-based regulation and rules-based regulation that can have a look at this article um, and it talks about maybe we should be looking sort of certainly at the regulatory side and many of you have professional bodies and and I know there's there's different um, awarding bodies um, that maybe looking at more principles. Terry, you'll laugh at me for the principles. I know I'm always a person that loved her principles <laughs> as a way of actually getting some sense of, of what an expectation is, but actually um, not having it so pinned down. So have a look at that article for those that are, that are particularly interested in that. I want to move on to expectations. This came through a lot and it is related to competencies. You know, um, expectations that are shattered, <laughs> hence the image, came through by, it's probably the most common theme that came through when I talked to the disciplines. And here's a couple of examples, I suppose, of the things that they were saying. Um, physiotherapy talked about managing expectations of all participants, that was the students, the staff, and, and, and those on sites, the different sites, different contexts. Hospitality talked about clear communication of academic expectations to the workplace. So the workplace knowing what the academic expectations are, that, that was a challenge. Guidance for employers on the requirements for student learning that came through with survey and construction management, similar point to hospitality, and students' expectations of what they need to learn. So the students themselves being aware of what they need to learn. Communicating these expectations um, came through in civil engineering, what was expected of the activities and then business information systems talked about students expectations of workload at the start of the pro at, the, at the placement so these were particularly um, expectations so really common so the competencies and expectations are quite related um, but they can be enhanced i think by two key things that also came up that's more dialogue between the different stakeholders and possibly learning contracts as, as, as one idea that came through. And what we meant by dialogue was a little bit like of what was meant for the research. That is really getting these three key broad stakeholders into the same room. And that is the sort of the practitioners, the students and the, the institutional staff. And, and there's other stakeholders, policy makers and things, but certainly these three key ones are, are, are key to have more dialogue. What do you mean by that standard? What do you mean by that competency? What does that mean in this place? And the students saying, I don't understand what you mean by that competency. I don't understand what you're expecting me of that competency because I haven't done it before or I have done it before. So really having this kind of dialogue um, around what is expected is we really, they, this came through a lot. We ne really need to enhance this. Um, and some of the solutions that the, the, the disciplines talked about, hospitality talked very practically about maybe we could start the, the session with the academic and workplace mentor in advance of the workplace, which maybe there's a piece there we really need to enhance. Development, possibly a replacement charter, clearly articulating what is required from all, all stakeholders and all will be involved in developing that. Maybe that's a potential solution. Um, more university partnerships between educator and practitioner, occupational therapy, we need to strengthen this partnership. Let me nursing talking as, as Sue was talking earlier, and some of you have mentioned, you know, this training, maybe we, we need to enhance training, maybe through the professional body. Um, is it something to enhance this? Um, the other survey and construction management talked a bit about body systems for the students. So these were maybe stakeholders 
um, between the student groups. So maybe more senior students or more graduates that could be bodies to students on placements and that kind of, of, of a dialogue enhancing that. And business information systems talked about opportunities to hear from students employers. Uh, so a lot coming through around increasing that dialogue. And one way forward is not the only way forward, uh, but one way forward that was coming through a lot was the, the idea of a negotiated learning plan or sometimes called a learning contract. And what some people were using this, others weren't. Um, and what it is, is really is some sort of a plan that is sat down that that the stakeholders sit down with at the beginning of a placement. Um, and negotiate, that's why I negotiate, it's not that the student goes in and says, I want to learn. The student might go in and say, I want to learn, but a placement will say, well, we don't do that here, <laughs> or we do it partly, or maybe we could do this instead. So it's, it is a negotiation, and that's a key term in it. Um, but what the literature says about it, and this is coming from Australia, but a lot written on this, is that the, these types of contracts or plans, whatever you want to call them, they help students be clearer about what they want from the placement. It's self-confidence to get them thinking about their role, that empowerment piece. Um, response to students' irritation that what much of it is assessed and learned, on, what, what much of what is learned on placement is not assessed. So they're learning things and doing things that don't relate at all to the form that they're being assessed on. And students get irritated. I'm doing loads of this, but it's not on the form, you know. So again, it gives an opportunity to actually put that down um, in, in this sort of a learning contract or, or plan. It recognized the immediacy of the work placement, that what's going on in the work placement. It enables a more convergent set of expectations between the university employers and students. And it allows for this diversity of work placements that many people talked about. Um, and many students who often hear say, well, I don't want to go on this placement because they don't do A's, um, whereas here they do. And then again, it's related to the grading, but it allows for diversity of placements that came up, up I think, again, in, in many of the different kind of disciplines. So um, my colleagues, those that know me, know that I was an occupational therapist in my past life, and my previous colleagues have kindly let me show from Trinity Occupational Therapy, have kindly let me show an example of their good um, learning contract form that they use in their placement with the link there at the bottom for the template and the guidance. So, you know, for those of you in there, they're happy for you to have a look at it. It's publicly available on their website. But this is an example of one that they use. And it does link on the left here with the competency. So there might be this competency. So it, it might link to something on that competency, but you can, you can have your learning objectives, what you intend to learn from students, what you what strategies and resources that might be there. So, well, listen, I'd love to do teamwork, but you know something, we only have an opportunity to work in pairs. So, you know, in this context, well, this is what you could, because the resources are only this. What's the evidence to show that they've met it, the validation that it's happened, the time scale it's happened in, and did they achieve it and, and any feedback. And this kind of thing, that's why these things are related. They work between those competencies that can be broad and sometimes too many. And even, but if they're too broad, then you know how, what, what, what you expect on the placement, the expectations. So these kind of things, I suppose, help with that tension between expectations and professional bodies and institutionals with competencies and diversity of practice. So it, it needs more work in this space. And learning contracts is one, one particular approach that, that can help it. Um, some of the suggestions from the discipline groups, business information systems talked about maybe doing an, a learning contract between the employer, student and university would be, would be useful, something that they're thinking of doing. Need to define what soft skills are will vary between disciplines. Again, this is, you know, you have a competency called, you know, ethical, it's ethical or professionalism. What does that mean in this context, you know? Um, increased responsibility for students to increase their ownership was something physiotherapy felt it would do. Again, physiotherapy said each site identifies more specific needs for the student coming to them and what they can offer for the learning. And role of the student to educate so there's a role for the student to educate the educator on what some competencies mean and gives students evidence of how what is achieved, like self-appraisal, and that came through in occupational therapy. So the students have a role in this to sort of empowerment. 
There's a nice little resource that's coming through um, in, in um, Deakin in Australia around assessing work integrated programs. And they also mention the learning a contract, they taught it a learning agreement. Um, often, interesting, they noted that it's easier if it's not graded. So if it's the pass fail or not graded, so but um, not necessarily always used in that context. So what we wanted to do again is maybe another breakout group just for 10 minutes um, a shorter session just have you used learning contracts um and again colin if you didn't mind in the chat putting in the instructions um again that would be helpful you might be ahead of me and done it already but <laughs> if you would put these instructions again like likewise into the chat colin and, and the question is have you used learning contracts or something similar um, how can they, or if you haven't used them, other, other approaches maybe to support the stakeholder dialogue and clarification of expectations? Um, so again, what we've done, same thing, we'll probably be in the same groups again, um, maybe or maybe not. We're hoping we'll get mostly in the same group again because we know each other. And um, we'll give you 10 minutes this time. And there's the link again. So if some, uh, somebody again would take a few notes, that would be great. And there's the link. So I'd say to you again to have a little look at the number you're going to go into. Um, mightn't be exactly the same number as last time, so just have a little check. And it certainly is on the top left hand or right hand of your screen if you don't see it. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, sorry I couldn't give you more time to chat. I'm sure you'd probably liked even more time, but just to keep on time and that, I hope you had a good good conversation. Some interesting stuff coming through. I won't share the screen, but the link is there if you want to have a look at it yourselves. Um, you can click, it, click on the link. Some really nice stuff coming through. Um, quite a few people are using learning contracts or, or something similar. A couple of people have asked, is this a learning contract? Because there's lots of kind of maybe contracts or more formalized contracts that are negotiated. I think one question was, would I call that a, a learning contract? I think the key thing about learning contract is there are all sorts of different sets of agreements and things that are set up and more formalized. And um, But I think to call it more a learning contract, the student individual needs needs to be um, sort of addressed in it. But whether they can do it or not do it, at least they're asked what, what they want to learn. And I think that makes it a learning contract in this is sort of the way I'm using it here. Um, but any sort of agreements that help clarify expectations are very valuable. Um, I see some people have said things that have done letter, like letters of expectations, very good idea. You know, roles and responsibilities um, mm -hmm. in advance, that's a really good idea. Um, there was a question about maybe we couldn't use learning contracts because we have diverse placements. But actually, to be honest, I would think that's the very time they're actually quite useful because of the diversity. So um, certainly, you know, happy to chat to people a little bit more about that if they wanted to again. Um, but it's the very time that actually learning contracts are useful because of that diversity um, where you have these broad competencies to say, well, you know, what does that mean in this diverse, this place versus this, which is so diverse. So, um, you know, maybe we could have a little look at that further if people wanted to chat to me again another time about that. But that's the very time I think it is useful. Um, some people have had some good experience of it internationally as well, and others have, have kind of um, experiences where they do it and sometimes don't do it, or they have kind of student tutor agreements, maybe different language on it, but um, and that's fine. There's no one language for this, but um, but these kind of tools and, and these kind of dialogues are really, really, really key. Um, I'm just going to move on because we're sort of coming towards the end. Um, just a sort of a kind of a final thought, um, just to wrap it all together. So we've got these standards, we have these competencies, we have these diversity of placements, and we're trying to work in this in this challenging space. That's why I think lots of opportunity for dialogue is good. I came across this, this quote, quite a recent quote from medical education literature, and I thought it actually is quite a good one maybe to try and summarize with. And that's the, that it says that the standardization of outcomes, although attractive in the accountability, and Sue talked a lot about QQI and accountability, and it's really important. We trust our system. Um, so there's accountability that it appears to offer. Nonetheless, risks oversimplifying the complex nature of competence, potentially creating a false sense of security around the capability of graduates. So this is because competence, to some extent, is inseparable from the context in which it is developed. It is not an, an immutable attribute of an individual, but rather a socially constructed notion that may reveal its fragility when context shifts. So I thought this was a really nice way of pulling it 
back together from some of the medical literature. We need to do it. It's important to do it. As Sue said in the beginning, we have to stand over our system. We have to, and many people have to stand to regulatory bodies. I know not everybody does, but you know many do. Um, but we do need to be very careful to not oversimplify it and have a sense that the standardization is actually making it less meaningful and less, less a learning experience. So I th thought this was a, a really nice way of kind of pulling it together just for the quote from, from that literature. So I, I'll finish on that because we're just a few minutes left and I might hand back to Terry actually just to talk to this slide and I'd, I'd like to thank you in particular for, for your engagement in it and, and your chat in the discussion groups and um, I'll hand back to you Terry if that's okay just to, to put it together. I will and thank you very much Ger and, and also thank you to, to Sue. Um, it, it, look this is a hugely interesting complex space that we're working in. And I think our shared wisdom will actually help us try and find uh, whatever solutions or pathways they are through this. And, and we already saw from what, what happened in the breakout rooms and also what's been shared in the chat, the number of different approaches that people are taking. And, and I think, well, I always say it anyway, we're stronger and smarter when we work together and we try and find solutions together. And so, you know, we're saying to you at the moment, say, what, how else can the forum and QQI um, help you to try and, I suppose, facilitate conversations uh, around this? And uh, what I'd like you to do, perhaps, is in the chat, if you have ideas about what our next steps uh, might be. I can give you one that I will definitely have, is that the National Forum are running uh, a week from the 8th to the 12th of November called Valuing Ireland's Teaching and Learning. And as part of that week, each of our fellows is going to uh, present in part of our, our scholarship hour. And um, Geraldine will be uh, giving more insights and more detailed insights from her research on the Wednesday session. So that's from 12.30 to 1.30 on November the 10th, if anybody would actually like to join us um, uh, with that. And we'll, we'll, we'll publicize it and, and send registration links and that out. Um, Jers just showed you all the, the different uh, the references that she's been looking into and that's so that they'll actually be on the recording. But what I'd actually like you to do, is there anything? Is there a big next step? Is there is, is it more conversations like this are useful? Are these are these kind of webinars sharing what we're doing, having opportunities to talk to each other? Are they useful? If you any ideas at all, we'd appreciate them if you could put them into the chat now in terms of how we can keep these conversations going and how we can learn. Uh, from each other. So with that, I'd just like to thank everybody um, for their support today. Um, you can, uh, the documents, the recording will be available on the National Forum uh, channel and also through our, through our website. Um, we'll uh, share with you to all the summaries of the, what you put, the, what you put and shared into the Google Docs during the breakout rooms. And so we'll make that available as well. Um, and if you have any thoughts at all, please uh, send them to myself, to Jur, um, or to QQI, and we'll be delighted to try and, um, and to respond uh, to your needs. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>